You believe that to be true? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Join me in Proverbs chapter 3. Happy Father's Day again to all the dads. There is a um, teaching for, for you today, but it's certainly applicable to all of us. There were some uh, notes for today's sermon. I hope you got some of those that were in the back. If not, there's probably a few more out there. But we're in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. You have notes today because I'm still trying to figure out the PowerPoint thing. It's still giving me, still giving me difficulties. At least part of this text is very familiar to many. So we're going to try to take the positive altogether, the negative instruction altogether, and then some general expectations at the end. But hopefully it's very practical, very meaningful to us. We could take longer than one Sunday, but we're not going to. So here we are in Proverbs chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, the word of the Lord says this. Trust in the Lord. Just trust in the Lord. Do it with all your heart. See, the inherent danger of knowing this text so well is that we just blow through it. I don't know what's going on in each of your lives. I know what's going on in many. But I know a very good positive instruction. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge the Lord. Acknowledge the Lord. And he will make your paths straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh. It will be refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, your vats will be bursting with wine. And my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. That's a rich, rich portion of Scripture. Let's try to keep it simple today. Positive instruction number one from verse five, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. The visual of the word here is coming and you 
kneeling before and prostrating making yourself prostrate before the person in whose service you are, humbly. I trust in Him and I entrust myself to Him in everything. I trust Him in good times. I trust Him in bad times. I've entrusted to Him my life. I've entrusted to Him my death. I've entrusted to Him every moment in between. I trust Him with my vocation. I trust Him with my marriage. I trust Him with my parenting. I trust Him with regard to my children. I trust Him. I trust Him. I trust Him. Trust in the Lord. Roll yourself upon Him. Throw your full person upon Him. No double-souled, S-O-U-L-E-D, no double-souled persons here. No double-minded persons. Trust in the Lord and do so with all your heart, with your whole person. Trust Him. I trust Him with my physical ailments. I trust Him with my disease. I trust Him to take care of my family. I trust Him with my whole heart. None of us do this perfectly. Amen? But the goal is certainly to strive for that. Agreed? I trust Him with my whole heart, my whole being. That He he is right, that He knows what is right, just, good, wise. And He will enact that for His glory. Regardless of what that is and what it looks like, He will enact that for His glory and ultimately for the benefit of those who follow Him, who trust Him with their whole heart. It's not saying that we're not active in having God enact His will through us, through wise decisions that we make. We only make those wise decisions because we've come into contact with the one who is wisdom. And we seek to enact God's will after Him. We seek to think God's thoughts after Him. But there's this... There's this sneaky self-centeredness. There's this sneaky American self-dependence. I trust in the Lord. When I sing words like you're worthy of worship, you're worthy of praise, you're worthy of honor, and then I take every problem and burden and circumstance of life and I bring it back in, God is worthy of all those things. But now I've got to trust myself to be able to take care of all the problems that are on my plate. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
Nothing good will come from this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I don't I don't think I can keep this up when I see and live in a culture where evil seems to prevail and good seems to be thwarted. I even have fellow professing Christians who are telling me that I'm on the wrong side of history on a number of things. It'd be so much easier just to trust in the Lord with all your heart. But pastor, his ways are hard. They are not. In fact, the Lord's commands are freeing. They keep you safe. And they provide for you what you need. That's why we trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Now, as I said before, I don't... I don't know the particulars of everybody who's in here today. I don't know what baggage you brought through the front door. But you do. So I want you to take a moment. You know one, two, three things right now. for which you need to trust in the Lord with all your heart. What are they? If you have a pen, write them down. You don't want to miss this moment. You don't want to forget What is it that's gripped your thinking, that has gripped your heart? What is it that's keeping you awake at night? What is it that you just can't let go? What is it that this week you know you must trust in the Lord with all your heart. Positive instruction number two, verse six. Acknowledge the Lord. Acknowledge him for who he is? Well, yes. I mean, it's the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God, the self-existent one, the one true, living, triune, creator, redeemer God whose story the Bible tells. Hallelujah. Acknowledge him for being who he is. Yes. But just acknowledge him. In all of your ways... You think of the Shema. In all of your ways, in your rising, in your sitting, as you come into the home, as you leave the home, as you're going to work, as you're coming back from work, as you're driving in the car, as you're shopping, as you're having conversations with people, acknowledge Him, acknowledge Him, acknowledge Him. Having a disagreement with your spouse, acknowledge the presence of the Lord. It will change the way you argue. Having a difficulty with a member of the church, acknowledge the presence of the Lord. Lord. 
irritated with your brother and sister? Acknowledge the presence of the Lord. Find yourself in the midst of temptation. Acknowledge the presence of the Lord. Wondering what decision you should make? In all of your ways, acknowledge the Lord. Live a life that consistently is lived in the presence of the Lord. You know that you are always in His presence. And where your heart is inclined deeply to have the Heavenly Father delight in the choices and steps that you make on the path that He has established for you, acknowledge the Lord. Now, I'll pause. Because you know better than I do in your life. You know, basically, what the plan is for this week. When will be those times when you are least likely to acknowledge that you are living in the presence of the Lord? When the reality is, they should be primary times when you are recognizing that you are living in the presence of the Lord so that He would guide your decision-making and you would seek to please Him through your steps. Write those down. Is it work? Is it in conversations that you have? with other brothers and sisters in Christ? Is it conversations that you have with spouses, friends, co-workers? Is it during your leisure time and the entertainment choices that you're making? Where do you need to acknowledge the Lord? Positive instruction number three, verse seven. Fear the Lord. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. His name, His kingdom, His will. Revere Him. We chiefly and supremely, we say this as a church family, in our constitution, we chiefly and supremely value and love God. Amen? This is what we have covenanted together. We chiefly and supremely value and love God. We revere Him. We stand in awe of Him. We sit in awe of Him. We lie before Him in awe of His majesty, of His grace, of His mercy, of His wondrous wisdom, justice, equity, righteousness. We revere the Lord. Jesus taught us to pray, revere God, revere the Heavenly Father, our Father who art in heaven, middle voice, cause your name to be central in us and through us on earth just as it is in heaven because we are concerned for your name. Our Father who art in heaven. 
Cause your moral and ethical rule to be established in us and through us on earth just as it is in heaven. Because we're concerned about your kingdom ethic. Our Father who art in heaven, cause your will to be accomplished in us and through us on earth just as it is in heaven. Because we are far more consumed with the passion of you accomplishing your will than we are about accomplishing our own personal will. We revere you. We stand in awe of you. Fear the Lord. I don't know how long it's been. For those who are followers of Jesus Christ, true disciples of Jesus Christ, bought through this shed blood, had his record of righteousness through his sinless life accounted to you as your record of righteousness through faith in Jesus live as witnesses to the resurrection where this dead man was raised to life, never to die again? How long it has been since you have voiced to the Lord in prayer that it is your sincere desire and delight to revere Him. That you're in awe of Him thanksgiving, gratitude. So, let's take a minute. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ, just bow where you are. And this becomes a time of corporate worship and prayer. Tell God, what you know to be true about Him and what you think of Him. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Positive instruction number four, verse nine. Honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. Respect Him, yes. Respect do His name. But honor? Honor also demands sacrifice on our part. I was told from the time I can remember. There are certain things that you do. There are certain ways that you act. There are certain things that you don't do. There are certain ways that you don't act because you have the last name of Halstead. Everything you do, son, reflects on our family name. That was a big deal to me.
it makes a difference. Grandpa lived a life of integrity that was well respected in the community, in church. My dad picked up that name. And with mom, mom and dad lived lives of integrity in the community where they were respected. I didn't want to do anything to do harm to the name. In fact, the goal was to live a life in such a way that the name would be honored. Does that make sense? And that the name would be honored, it took some sacrifice. There are some things that innately you wanted to do that you couldn't do. There were some times when you wanted to say something that you couldn't say, shouldn't say. See, in in some sense, you you had to be willing to sacrifice your, your own individual name in order to honor the greater family name. That's not less true with us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We could go back to the Lord's Prayer again and rehearse what we just said. We honor the name, but not just any name, not just any other family name. This is the one true living triune creator, redeemer God we're talking about here, amen? We honor His name. We seek to promote His name above all. We seek In our human understanding, we seek to protect His name above all. And it does come with sacrifice. Amen or no? Honoring the Lord is going to come with sacrifice. But if I gave a little bit here, I mean, if I didn't follow the Lord quite as much here, I, I could make a big name for myself, and once I made a big name for myself, then I could do great things for God. Do you hear how messed up that is? Now, we're never going to say those words out loud, but there are plenty of us who have thought the thought. One day I'll have a platform to really speak for God, but right now, I've got to live my life and make my name in order to get to that platform. Well, if it's been all about you in the process, it's going to be all about you at the end as well. Don't kid yourself. We honor the name. Again, not just any name, the name above all names. The name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The church's risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We honor the name. We do whatever He calls us to do to honor the name. We sacrifice whatever He calls us to sacrifice to honor the name. Because that's who we are. In Jesus Christ. And in this particularity in verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your possessions. And as far as I can recollect, the only portion of Proverbs 1 through 9 where we have a hint toward the idea of corporate worship. with the first fruits of your produce. 
you don't give God what's left over. Amen? Isn't that the deal? I'm going to expend everything I have on my name, kingdom, will, and whatever I have left materially, God can have some of that. I can go beyond material wealth as well. I'm going to give all my energy to my name, kingdom, will, and if I have energy, any energy left, then maybe I'll do something that honors the name of Christ. I'm going to spend all my time pursuing my name, my kingdom, my will, and if I have any time left, then maybe I can carve out a brief period of time in order to honor God. No. We chiefly and supremely value and love God. And because of that, our time, our money, our energy, our possessions, they are God's who has given them to us on loan to steward for a period of time for His glory, for His namesake, honor the name. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Okay, so we pause. Here's the deal. I want you to think about what it is <clears throat> that you have received with open hands from God. Because everything we have and everything we are, would you agree with me, we've received with open hands from God? It's just His grace that has allowed us to enjoy what, what we have. Now, I want you to think deeply what are those things that you've received with open hands from God? But if you're being honest with yourself, you know now you have not kept those hands open so that God can use what He's given for His purpose. But you have tightened the grip. So you're no longer stewarding God's good gifts are just yours now. To do with what you want whenever you want to. Without care or concern for honoring the name. What are those things? Money? house, children, that was a tough one, wasn't it? Vocation, what is it? You have a pen, write them down, because you know what they are. By God's grace and for His glory, spend some deep time reflecting on this this week so that God, by His grace, may pry those fingers so that they come back down to open hands. Do you see how these fit together? A person who trusts in the Lord with all their heart will be able to do that very thing in honoring His name in sacrifice. Negative instruction number one, verse five. I'm not going to spend as much time on these. <clears throat> Negative instruction, it's just good to have them delineated so that you can see them clearly, and hopefully this little sheet can provide a framework for your thinking as you go through the day. Negative instruction number one, verse five, do not lean on your own understanding. Do not rely on your own wisdom. 
that's when we stop trusting in the Lord. Do not lean on your own understanding. Do not rely upon your sense of what is best in the situation when you have not looked at, considered, and surrendered to the revealed will of God as far as He has made it known. When we look at God and we say, hey, thanks for life, but I'm choosing everything that I'm choosing according to my wisdom, according, according to what I think is best, because I'm a pretty smart person, I know how things work, and here is what we're going to do. Don't be wise, don't lean on your own understanding. Negative instruction number two, they go hand in hand. Negative instruction number two, verse seven, don't be wise in your own eyes. Because if you're leaning on your own understanding, if you're relying on your understanding of a situation, if you're relying on your own understanding with regard to morality, without trusting in the Lord that He is right and wise in what He says about this particular sense of morality, if you are trying to be wise in your own eyes, exalting yourself, you are not trusting in the Lord with all your heart. We can say that all we want, but the reality is our actions betray the reality of our heart and mind. We are not trusting in the Lord with all our heart, and we are not acknowledging the Lord in every area of the steps that we're taking in the path that He has placed us upon. When we are wise in our own eyes, we have exalted ourselves and we do not revere the Lord. We revere ourselves. And that's not a good place to be for anyone. Negative instruction number three, verse seven. Turn away from evil. This just sounds like a really good instruction, amen? If, if you chiefly and supremely value and love the Lord, you fear Him and you revere Him above all else, and you're concerned about honoring the Lord, sacrificing what you may want for the name above all names. You want, to, you want to glorify the name and revere the Lord. Then you should stay away from all that is completely contrary to the God whom you chiefly and supremely love and value and revere. Amen? Oof. If you chiefly and supremely value and love God, you should probably stay away from evil because it is completely contrary to His person and character. Amen? Ooh. I hope there's an internal amen going on in there. These two are contrary the one to the other. That's what Galatians 5 tells us. Standard of the flesh, standard of the spirit, the two are contrary, the one to the other, so you don't do what you want to do, Galatians 5, 17. It's not like you can have one foot in one camp and one foot in another camp. The two are diametrically opposed to one another. There is all that is good, namely God, and all that is not consistent with God's character and person is evil. It's sin. See, you know what people who are concerned about protecting and promoting the name do? They turn and run. Now, 
you know what your wrestlings are. You know what your darker sins are. You know what evil you're going to face during the course of this week. Maybe not all of it, but much of it you do. Write it down. There's no way I'm writing that one down just in case I leave it here on the sheet. I'm gonna... Then don't forget it. Because by God's grace and for God's glory, the church needs to renew its commitment to holiness and turn from evil. What is it that you need to turn from this week? Negative instruction number four, verse 11. Do not despise the Lord's discipline. But it hurts. Yeah. I want you to understand this word discipline here. We often think about it as the the chastisement for doing wrong. You know, you're getting that, that spanking that's there. A eh, little bit of it there. But this is disciplined instruction, again, in Proverbs 1 through 9, primarily. I'm tired of the Lord's discipline. It's hard to dig deep into the Word of God. I don't, I just don't have the time to study the Word of God like I probably know that I should. I just don't have the energy left to see the wonderful things in God's Word and pray to the Spirit that He would illumine my understanding as I read the text of Scripture. See, we don't have time for it? Right. Don't have energy for it? Right. Lord's instruction is too hard? Yes. Isn't it interesting how we always find money and we always make time for the things that are most important to us? We do. And isn't it interesting that the things that we truly love regardless of how difficult they are, we will put the effort in to knowing and practicing because we see worth in it. Did you say the Word of God has worth or that it's worthless? Let me ask it a different way. With the time and energy that you spent in God's Word this past week, would that answer the question as God's Word being Worthy of your time and effort or worthless? Who knew Proverbs 3, 5 through 12 could be
Don't despise the Lord's discipline. He continues to instruct because He loves you. Again, negative instruction number five follows suit, verse 11. Do not be weary of His reproof. Not one of us in the house likes to be corrected. Just naturally, as fallen, sinful human beings, don't like to be corrected. God says, (laughs) I get to correct you. I created your life. I sustain your life. I've given you new life in my Son, those who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord. I'm concerned about your life. I guide your life. And when you veer off the path that I have clearly made for you, I will correct your life. And I do so because I love you. Every parent in the house understands this. I instructed my children and led my children, made my children do things that they did not want to do in order that they could become the people that deep down they wanted to become. Needed to become. God has us do things that naturally we may not want to do because He is making us after the image of His Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the head of the church. And there's nothing greater than that. See, when we embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, we said we were all in. Whatever God wanted to do, He could do. Whatever was necessary in us to be more conformed to the image of Jesus, the one who gave His life for us and we were so thankful, we would follow, we would obey, we would change, we would not be conformed to this world. We'd be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we excitedly started down that path. And by God's grace, we must continue. Do not grow weary of His reproof. It comes because He loves you and has your best in store and in mind and grieves when you and I transgress and walk off the path that He has laid before us. Which leads us to general expectation number one. Verse 6, if you will trust in the Lord, if you will acknowledge the Lord, if you will fear the Lord, if you will honor the Lord, He will make straight your paths. you'll be able to see all the little trails that are going off, but you'll recognize them as wrong trails that are leading away from the path that God has laid before you. With God's Word being a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, He will make straight your paths. General expectation number two. Verse 8, healing and nourishment, refreshment to your bones. It is good for God's people to follow Him.
I think I've told you before. When I served with a committee who was working through ethical things up at Northern Michigan Hospital in Petoskey, Michigan, the study was done just to show what percentage of ailments were related to people, were, were related to simply not living according to God's biblical standards. And the percentage was amazing. God, consistent with his character, knowing the persons that he has created and how he's created them, has established boundaries for our provision and protection. It is good to honor the Lord. It is good to fear the Lord. It is good to acknowledge Him in all things. General expectation number three, very quickly. Verse 10, barns with plenty, vat bursting. Amen. I always love being able to end a sermon with a health and wealth gospel. Especially in a Baptist church when your vats are bursting with wine. That's even better. Don't start it, Pastor. Barns with plenty, vats bursting. You know, later on in Proverbs, God gives, us, uh, God gives us a pretty clear description of what real wealth is. Do you remember that? As the writer is writing and saying, you know, this is what I ask for. I ask that I have enough so that I would not have to steal in order to put bread on the table for my family. But I also ask that I don't have so much that I would become self-sufficient and forget the name of the Lord my God. So how much is that? I don't know. According to our federal government, apparently it's $400,000. But No, what is it? it's different for different people. Do you have enough? Has God provided enough that you don't have to steal in order to put bread on your table? Then give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Has God kept you from having so much that you've become self-sufficient in your attitude and action so that you have forgotten the name of the Lord? Has he protected you from that? Then give thanks. because your barns have plenty and your vats are bursting. God has been good. Brothers and sisters, remember who and whose you are. That's what Proverbs 3, 5 through 12 is really saying. Remember who and whose you are and walk faithfully with God. Trust in the Lord. Acknowledge the Lord. Fear the Lord, honor the Lord with everything that we have talked about, with all those things that some of you have written down on paper, some of you have written down on the tablets of your heart or mind. We gather together as a church family to celebrate as well the Lord's Supper as we conclude our time together in corporate worship renewing covenant with God and with one another, bringing these very things before God. 
remembering, remembering that we can trust in the Lord, acknowledge the Lord, fear the Lord, honor the Lord, especially as people who have come into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ and His sinless life lived on our behalf so that His record of righteousness could become our record of righteousness. Let that person eat of the bread and drink of the cup who is living in right fellowship with God and His people, who acknowledge Him, who fear Him, who honor Him, who trust Him, who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, who are so deeply thankful for the body which was given for us, the blood which was shed for us. But the person who will eat that bread and drink the cup Let them examine themselves. Brothers and sisters, I invite you at this time, as the praise team comes forward, to do two things. One, if you have not yet gotten elements and you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, somebody who's embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord has been baptized you wish to participate in the Lord's table, you are welcome to do so. You can come to the front. I don't know that there are any left at the back, but you can come to the front and, re- and get the elements. But spend time in prayer, examining your hearts and minds before God so that we might eat of the bread and drink of the cup in a worthy fashion. Let's pray.